Hello, dear listeners. I'm presenting a work dedicated to dedicated to <laughs> I'm presenting a work dedicated to massively parallel SPH meso modeling of shock loaded spherical particles. I'll start with experimental data and mathematical modeling problems. Here is the experimental setup we are going to uh, describe. Uh, oxygen plane wave generator on the bottom, then above it copper and dental plate. In a dental plate, dental is a tungsten alloy. In dental plate there are some notches machined in which uh, golden spheres, very small golden spheres, are placed or the notch is empty or it's filled with grooved plate. When the oxygen is detonated, uh, it's expected that the shock wave uh, goes through copper, uh, dental, come to, uh, come to a layer of spheres and uh, the spheres go up uh, where uh, their velocity is measured by PDD probes. So what do the experiment experimentators obtain? They obtain the following uh, plots of velocity from time dependent from PDD probes. And what do we see? We see that when the shock breaks out, uh, there are mm, some uh, fragments of material with different velocities and different decay uh, appear. And that's the problem. So what is really measured in the experiments if it's not the initial spheres? So we need to solve the following problems. What physical processes take place in the layer of golden spheres during shockwave propagation? Do the particles preserve their shape or if they do not, then what's the composition of ejected material? And uh, does accumulation or fragmentation takes place? And uh, to answer all these questions, uh, we need to conduct direct numerical modeling on mesoscale as is. So we directly model golden spheres, dental plate, uh, shockwave propagation in the layer, and etc. So how to do it? So modeling matter choice and computational domain layout. There are some modeling complications because we have non-trivial geometry many, many spheres, many sampless contacts and uh, shares flows are expected. If we choose traditional mesh methods, we obtain high accuracy, there will research. Uh, if we choose Euler uh, view, we will, we will have to use specific methods of contact and pre-surface tracking. If we use Lagrange point of view, then we will have to use mesh reconstruction. But we have an option to use Lagrangian meshless methods. So we do not need mesh. It means that we do not need to store connectivity between elements. It may change freely. Uh, in these methods, contact surfaces are tracked automatically. They are computationally hard, but uh, are simply program implemented. Of all the variety of these meshless methods, we uh, choose smooth particle hydrodynamics and uh, its variant, uh, which we call contact smooth particle hydrodynamics. Uh, contact because uh, it contains Riemann problem solution on contact between particles. Uh, mm. This is a particle method with limited interaction length between particles and that is why it can be paralyzed effectively. On the slide you can see uh, the figures that show what's the difference between uh, mesh and particles. So in a mesh everything is connected and particles are <coughs> uh, separated and they can freely, uh, well, mix. So that was the computational domain uh, layout in real life on the left. And on the right, uh, you can see uh, how we do model this. So uh, we took a lot of spheres, placed them on a uh, well thin layer of the plate and hit all the system into solid wall to obtain the uh, needed shock wave. The data on velocity is uh, got from the experimental work. Each particle, each SPH particle carries uh, creation of state, ideal elastoplasticity model and liquid solid phase transition. Uh, there may be a uh, misunderstanding between golden particles and SPH particles. So SPH particles, they are like this, placed in a one single golden sphere. And this is how uh, they are traditionally uh, figured, like balls. So one golden particle 
uh, which flows out from the experimental setup, consists of many SPH particles. Uh, there are several computational domain layout styles we used. So the first is, I call it plain pack. It contains three million of SPH particles, looks like this. Uh, dense pack looks like this. The of course, simulation is in 3D. Uh, and also, uh, the new results we obtained recently is uh, modeling of irregular pack, as uh, it is, of course, apparent in the experiment. Uh, how do we do it? We uh, randomly place the spheres. There are periodical boundary conditions here, here and here. We place them randomly, and then we just pack them using our code, like direct modeling of ballistical packing. Uh, this simulation uses uh, eight and two million particles. There are some side view of the sample pack. And it's clearly seen that there is so many SPH particles that uh, all the modeling needs a proper parallel approach. So what do we do here? We use uh, utilization technique uh, for distributed memory system. Uh, we call it Werner Dynamic Domain Decomposition, or VD3. So what's the idea? First, a uh, definition of the Werner diagram. If we have a set of points on some sample, uh, 1 point, 2 point, 3, and etc., cetera, uh, then each point uh, makes its own uh, diagram cell, points in which, so every point in this area, are closer to this point than to any other point. So here points are all closer to this point, here all these points are close to this point. And all these uh, cells comprise the Werner diagram. What's the idea of the composition? Uh, if this sample is not just a sample, it's our SPH sample filled with particles, and we uh, put the Werner diagram on it, uh, we say that each of these points correspond to one process, so one process, two process, and n process. And we let these points move with SPH particles flow and load in subdomains. Uh, how it looks like. So, for example, process one has very high load. We just move the point generator out, and uh, the boundaries move also. And some particles from uh, area one move to adjacent areas. And that is why the load is reduced and uh, so uh, the simulation is quite balanced. Uh, we show here the strong scalability test result for a sample static problem of a uh, plate at rest containing uh, 52 million of particles from 100 to 1,000 uh, processes. So it's clear seen that scalability is quite good and it is enough to effectively model the problem. Uh, some remark, uh, one process contains, well, up to one, two hundred <coughs> of thousands. <coughs> now the results of the mesoscale modeling. First, uh, regular packing results, then spec. When a shock wave comes to, uh, comes to layer of spheres, accumulation effects appear here. So, uh, we see these eddy structures typical for richmeyer mishkov instability, and they continue to progress in time. When shockwave comes to the surface of the pack, uh, jets appear that freely expand into vacuum. We do not model air, only uh, gold, uh, tungsten, and vacuum. The overall figure looks like this, no, from here to here. So. Uh, the structure, the initial structure is completely lost. And uh, some jets continue to propagate uh, into the vacuum. Oh, excuse me. Here are the results for plain pack. And here you can see that the jets that do appear at the contact between uh, plate and spheres, they appear and they have free space to flow into, so they are uh, the jet head doesn't hit into the particles that uh, are situated before it. It just continues to freely expand. And we see that in such a situation, we, uh, jets, huge jets appear, which heads are here, and this is the jet body. Uh, 
Uh, the next result is a uh, real pack, the whole, sim the whole simulation. Uh, I suppose that uh, nothing uh, can be uh, uh, understandable <laughs> from, from this video, so let's have a closer view. When a shock wave comes to the surface between uh, spheres and uh, plate, also eddy structures are formed, but they are not symmetric, not so uh, right. So, but the picture is the same as for regular dense pack. On the right hand side, you can see uh, the pressure distribution picture. Behind the shockwave front, the material, uh, quite all the material <coughs> is melted except for some spots of solid centers of golden particles. When a shockwave comes to the surface of the layer, also jets appear from the upper layer of the pack. And as in uh, the dense pack situation, they continue to uh, freely propagate. So that's the uh, side view. All the quite all the material is melted except for some spots. And that's the uh, more closer view of the initial film. So here is what is left from the uh, transmitter or plate in our simulation. That's the lower layer of spheres deformed. This is the main mass. Main mass is situated here and these are remains of the jets. So some uh, plots, mass per area and velocity dependence here is mass per area of a slice of small slices by uh, as the uh, jets propagate this x. So the main mass has a velocity from well two kilometers per second and uh, more. So in the experiment we observed that after shock wave. Uh, breaks out of the layer, then the distribution of velocities, well, is uh, quite in a good agreement with what we can see here. Well, this is what we obtained. We've uh, explained what happens in the layer. Uh, we developed a highly efficient SPH code for parallel mesoscale modeling of materials and extremes, and this code allows us to reveal the underlying mechanisms determining complex flow evolution. Uh, we were the first who showed that uh, in the problem that we demonstrate here uh, uh, contains ejecta. Uh, we have found that ejecta characteristics and uh, riefmeyer mishkov uh, instability effect are developed and they depend on initial layer packing configuration that we used in our modeling. Uh, well, the last slide showed that the thin mass velocity distribution of ejecta is in a good agreement with experimental data provided. Uh, and uh, the last word, so the code that we used, it provides the information that is impossible to obtain from the experiment. That's all. Uh, we used Wendland kernel as the uh, approximating function as uh, is it is standard for SPH simulations. So yes or no? Uh, what you so asked pot do about do potential, yeah? Occupy the same place yes, of course, time. yeah. And did your model allow two spheres to be at the same place? At the same time? No, the SPH approximation does not allow this. Okay. If, so if they, if, yeah. <laughs> pressure becomes high if they come close. Could you tell me what a golden sphere is? <coughs> you call the sphere golden. Yes. What's golden about the sphere? It's a ball. Well, a ball. yeah, actually it's, it's a ball. And you call it, you, so all, all balls are golden, let's say. Yeah. Okay. So do you ever do the simulations with prolate shapes? What is prolate shape? Well, it's like a football. So the aspect ratio is different than one. Huh? Like a football. Uh, no, no, we uh, we've done it only for uh, right shape. Okay. Uh, any other questions, please? Yes. Is 
<laughs> Just a correction. <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, my name is Babak Rabbanipur, as you already heard. I'm coming from the University of Lille, uh, and I'm working on a melting driven by a thermal convection, together with Dr. Carl Zavarini and Dr. Silvia Hirata. Uh, melting and uh, freezing convection is happening in larger scale in environment, in phenomena like lava lakes, magma chambers, and the one that we are interested in, in melting of ice in North Pole, Arctic. Why we are interested in? Because melting of ice uh, results in formation of ponds, and these ponds are darker than uh, surrounding environment. They absorb more heat, and uh, the rate of uh, melting is increasing. The fact is that during the last 20, uh, uh, 20 years, we have several models, uh, large model, uh, large scale models for predicting uh, uh, the environment in Arctic, but they all fail. We consider that, uh, we assume that this uh, problem is due to this uh, formation of ponds, because the scale of these ponds are much smaller than the uh, large scales uh, for uh, simulation of the Arctic. Uh, uh, they, they, they cannot be resolved. So the, there should be some kind of tuning to uh, have the effect of these ponds in the simulations. Well, what is happening, in fact, uh, the cycle of ice uh, melting of ice starts during the springtime when the uh, uh, snow layer uh, at the top starts to melt and forms a, a layer of water on the top of the ice. During the summertime, the growth of uh, the melting, uh, the, the rate of melting grows, and uh, sometimes we have some channels that connect the uh, water inside the ponds to the ocean, uh, the open water of the ocean. During uh, winter season, uh, we have again the formation of ice. Sometimes these ponds completely uh, solidifies. Sometimes uh, we have only a cap of ice on top of it. Uh, the Governing fact that the, uh, these ponds are governed by uh, cold water at the bottom due to being in touch uh, with ice, warmer water at the surface because of warm uh, air, warmer uh, environment, and solar radiation. And uh, the fact that density profile of water is inverse between zero to four degrees. So these ponds, uh, are prone to have uh, convection. We created a model to analyze this system. This model is consists of uh, uh, ice. At the beginning, we start to heat the system uh, with temperature T0 greater than the uh, temperature Tm, which is the temperature of solid, uh, the temperature, the melting temperature of solid. We fix the height of the system uh, as H max. Uh, when we start the simulation, a layer of liquid appears at the bottom, and at some height, uh, we, uh, the convection starts. The governing equation for the system is Navier-Stokes equation, of course, together with temperature equation and the boundary uh, conditions. Uh, for liquid, uh, for the uh, liquid part of the melting, uh, we have. Uh, the part that is in touch with uh, solid layer, and it's not regular. At the bottom, it's flat, and the lateral boundary condition, which respectively, at the top, we have uh, a Stefan boundary condition, which is known. 
uh, together with zero, uh, zero uh, velocity. At the bottom, constant temperature. And for the lateral wall, we have periodic boundary condition. Uh, it is known that if uh, we uh, take uh, the step on uh, boundary condition into uh, temperature, boundary, uh, temperature equation, uh, we can uh, bring it into single domain formulation. Considering the length of the system, the total length of the system as the length uh, scale, uh, we can uh, add dimensionalize our system, uh, which, will be, uh, in, uh, which will be dependent to three global parameters of a Stefan uh, number, which is the uh, specific heat to latent heat times uh, temperature, different, uh, temperature difference, and it is defined the rate of the melting. Prandt number, which is already known, I guess everybody knows here, and the uh, Rayleigh, uh, which is known also as free convection or natural convection, uh, and it defines if it is below some critical value, uh, the, uh, the main uh, temperature uh, is transferred by conduction, and when it is higher than the critical value, the temperature is transferred transfer mainly due to convection. For the materials that we know already, the Stefan problem for rocks uh, in form of lava or magma uh, is between is in order 1 to 10, uh, and Prand is in order uh, 10 to the power of 4 to 10 to the power of 8. For water, uh, which we are interested in, uh, Stefan uh, number is in order of 10 to the power of minus 2, and Prand in order of 10. Okay. Uh, there is another parameter which is important in our computation, and it is the average height of the melting, uh, which is defined the, uh, where the uh, interface, the solid-liquid interface is located. Uh, respectively, uh, we have another parameter which is, which is uh, really effective and is defined based on this uh, melting uh, front height. In this way, Rayleigh really effective at time zero is zero, of course, and at time uh, when the total system, the, uh, the total solid is melted, uh, Rayleigh really will be Rayleigh really max. Uh, in a system of uh, uh, melting, the, it is governed by heat. Either it's coming inside the system or going out of the system. The heat, uh, if it is normalized, the, it is known as Nusselt number, Nusselt uh, effective coming in, in, Nusselt effective in, and Nusselt effective out. Writing it in a uh, form of equation, it is a uh, difference of temperature at the bottom, and, I mean Nusselt in is uh, the uh, gradient of temperature at the bottom, and Nusselt out is the rate of, uh, uh, ch rate of changes of uh, uh, melting front, uh, divided by a Stefan number. Uh, conservation of energy requires that what is coming in with the energy coming inside the system should be equal to the energy going out of the system plus the temperature that increasing in the liquid layer. We know that this temperature uh, uh, increase in the liquid layer, uh, layer is always greater than zero. It means that the uh, uh, Nusselt out is always smaller than Nusselt in. For the conductive case, the solution is known. It is known as a Stefan problem. The height of interface is proportional to the square root of time. Uh, and the profile of temperature is in form of uh, error function. Likewise, uh, Nusselt effective in and out can be computed numerically. And as you can see, it's independent of time. Uh, the problem of melting has been addressed quite a lot. Uh, I mentioned some of them, uh, which is related to our project. For instance, uh, Peter and Bijan, they uh, started, uh, they, uh, they uh, re performed research on uh, melting, uh, lateral melting. They are heating the system from the side. Uh, also, uh, Volvorova, uh, they addressed the problem of heating numerically. Uh, they use the same setup. They are heating the system from the bottom, but in different contexts. They are uh, using it in for the uh, simulation of uh, magma and lava lakes. Experimentally, uh, we have Davis uh, who performed uh, simulation, uh, who performed experiment on the melting of ice, uh, and he focused mainly on the 
shape of the interface and what is happening to the interface. We have Hill uh, who performed on uh, glycerol, uh, which is quite uh, different to ice uh, uh, for high Rayleigh. And uh, we have Yen. Again, he performed uh, new, uh, experimental on uh, melting of ice, but in a different condition. They started to melt the ice from the bottom. It's the different configuration uh, to pounds. And uh, Sogovara, uh, which did again, they, uh, they focus on the interface and the shape of the interface. And they saw something they called as shark skin uh, pattern in the interface. Now the question is that, can we connect uh, heat flux to the global parameters of the system? Is there any characteristic for the roughness or the length of the, uh, the domes that is happening or rolls that is appear, appearing in the interface? Or, and it, do they have some kind of feedback? Which one has effect on the other one? Uh, the interface on the flow or the flow on the interface? The solution uh, for the in conductive, in uh, convect, uh, convective uh, regime, the solution, uh, the analytical solution for the height of the system, height of the interface is unknown. But the fact that we have a relation between new silt uh, and the uh, uh, average height of the system can be used to derive some uh, uh, scaling uh, relations. Similar to Navier uh, uh, relevant art uh, system, one can assume that uh, Nusselt is a, a, a power scaling of Rayleigh, Prandt, and uh, Stefan. Likewise, for the, uh, the interface, average of interface height, uh, depending on time, Prandt, and Stefan. And if we work the relation in this way, we find this equation. And there are some observations in order from this equation. First of all, we saw that Nussel is not uh, dependent on time. Uh, uh, it's constant uh, during conductive case. So alpha is zero in that case. Uh, so uh, we see that uh, the height of interface is proportional to a square root of time, which we already know from SFN problem. In Malkus scaling, similar to Rayleigh Bernard, if the alpha is one third, we see that the, the velocity of interface is constant. And if uh, we can see there uh, alpha one half in ultimate regime similar to Rayleigh Menard system, then the acceleration of the interface will be constant. For the numerical part, uh, we created a code. This code is uh, based on lattice Boltzmann in 2D and 3D. It can be used for simulating Rayleigh Menard system or melting. Uh, both together uh, in different times, of course. And uh, the governing part for the uh, melting is uh, at the beginning, uh, the melting fraction is zero. We compute velocity and temperature based on lattice Boltzmann method. From this uh, temperature and velocity, we compute uh, uh, enthalpy. Uh, we derive a linear interpolation of, uh, of enthalpy for computing the uh, liquid fraction, and this liquid fraction for next time can be computed by finite difference. We can compute this uh, loop uh, over several times till we get uh, uh, enough accuracy, but it's known that even one iteration is enough to uh, have a solution uh, in uh, conductive ca case similar to uh, accurate enough to analytical solution. However, in the uh, so, uh, solid part, we have to cancel the velocity, unwanted velocity. Uh, by, by the method of penalization we, uh, force, we can remove unwanted velocity uh, appearing due to the computation. Uh, before going further, uh, let me show you a movie uh, to see what is happening uh, qualitatively in the, uh, in the system. First, uh, uh, this system uh, starts at uh, SF1, uh, 1, prime 10. We heated up the system from the beginning. At the beginning, you saw that the interface is moving uh, parallel. Uh, it's flat. And then we, create, we see the convection appearing in the system. This convection goes further and further. The cells are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, finally, at some point, it starts to merge. 
for instance, at this point, you see that we have only four rows. Previously, we had three. And here, now we have merging of two cells. This way, we cannot appreciate what is happening in the system. So let's look at some snapshot of this uh, configuration. At the beginning, as I told you, we have the regular steady convection appearing in the system. This is the first uh, destabilization in the system. And then at some point, this also destabilized again, and the role uh, starts to merge together, the roles uh, merging completely, and now it's come, uh, becoming, uh, we, we have less roles here. And again, it goes further and further till we have only one role, and it's confined only by bilateral uh, boundary conditions. We try not to get to that point because the effect of lateral boundary condition also on the system is, has been observed. So we try to only have one parameter at a time uh, for uh, our simulations. Similar to Rayleigh-Bernard system, we can uh, look at the new cell coming in the system versus Rayleigh for uh, convective melting. Uh, if we put uh, Rayleigh-Bernard system, which we computed with the same code, the parameters for uh, convective uh, melting and Rayleigh-Bernard are the same. Uh, the only thing that is changing for Rayleigh-Bernard system is the height of the system similar to convective melting. They are, you are seeing that they are in good agreement with each other. Uh, and uh, at high Rayleigh regime, they are uh, converging to the same point. Already I told you about Olvarova and they performed the simulation, but they use different parameters. I put, uh, put same, uh, uh, com the same comput uh, their computation on our uh, computation to only for the sake of one comparison. And what we see here is that uh, first, the onset of convection for uh, convective melting is delayed uh, compared to Rayleigh-Bernard system. The heat flux is slightly larger in uh, uh, convective melting than uh, Rayleigh-Bernard system. At the ultimate regime, they are getting closer to each other. And even uh, it is inconsistent with uh, other uh, computation, uh, Olvarova. Uh, also, they, change, uh, they use different parameters. And only for observation, I put the uh, slope of uh, this uh, line for uh, uh, relevant R system, which you see is less than one third here. Likewise, we can uh, look at uh, Reynolds number, which is defined at the average velocity times height of the interface divided by uh, viscosity. Uh, you see the similar behavior. Uh, for Rayleigh-Bernard system and conv uh, convective. And why we have this similarity? This is a question. Uh, if you con consider the velocity of the interface as this, uh, if it is much smaller than the average velocity of the uh, liquid uh, in li liquid part, uh, uh, the system has enough flexibility to stabilize this and becomes like, uh, behaves like a Rayleigh-Bernard system. From this, we you get this uh, equ uh, inequality, uh, and if we bring Nussel uh, out uh, to the right-hand side uh, and plotted it, we see that it's, uh, this e parameter is always greater than one, and uh, at the beginning of convection, it's in order of 10. Uh, also, we have 3D uh, system. Uh, it is similar to It was a movie, but it didn't play. Uh, similar to uh, to the uh, scenario, we have uh, the system of convection, but the freedom here is uh, higher. Uh, we put the uh, to the convective melting Rayleigh Bernard and 3D on top of each other to compare. Uh, as you can see, the 3D in convective is uh, the, the uh, heat uh, flux in 3D is higher than uh, uh, 2D and even higher than uh, Rayleigh-Bernard uh, 3D. For the sake of comparison with uh, uh, experimental, we chose uh, grossman lohse theory, and we plotted on top of uh, our uh, plots. And uh, you can see that the, uh, for Rayleigh-Bernard system is in really good, uh, uh, it's comparable in a good condition. Uh, and the message is that uh, new cell melting in 3D is higher than 2D and is higher than in 3D. Another thing that we can look in is the 
morphology of the interface. Uh, you see there, there is some kind of uh, polygonal, uh, hexagonal pattern in the interface, especially at the uh, onset of convection. It, it has been said uh, during, uh, for experimental that is kind of hexagonal. It's difficult to conclude this kind of hexagonal pattern. Uh, there are different kinds of uh, uh, polygonal uh, that I can see here at least. Uh, for the qualification, we can use two uh, different parameters. One is the uh, height of the uh, inter height of the rows uh, in the interface, uh, which can be identified uh, as a deviation, and the length of the uh, uh, rows as a correlation function. So we put uh, 2D and 3D here. I try to wrap it up as soon as possible because there are some more information here. Uh, at the beginning, uh, it is zero uh, because the interface is flat. It follows with a jump uh, and it says more or less constant. Remember that it's uh, been scaled by uh, the height of the interface. And then we have the second jump. It is where the uh, rolls starts to merge together and it's more or less it stays in a same regime. It means that uh, the aspect ratio of the cells stays in the same value. Uh, however, for uh, deviation of interface, for 3D you see that the depth of the roll is much higher than 2D. Uh, the message here is that uh, in 3D, the path to single dome, uh, dome shape cell is much smo smoother than 3D, uh, and the cells are much deeper in 3D. Another parameter can, uh, that can be analyzed is the effect of Stefan. We did it only for 2D at the moment. Uh, you see that the shape, the, the behavior of the uh, uh, system based on different Stefan number is more or less the same. So the, effect of SFON is negligible, it's not that huge. Uh, we computed that this uh, is of order of 10 to the power of minus 2. Uh, SFON uh, to the power of minus uh, uh, 0 point, uh, 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 SFON uh, uh, to the power of 0 0.1. Uh, and the other fact that we can see is uh, the uh, relation between new cell in and new cell out. It more or less stays in a con uh, constant value and is really close to the uh, solution of the conductive case. Uh, this is a good news because it says that uh, the, there is a relation between uh, heat coming in and out of the system and it can be used for uh, different uh, uh, um, application in tuning the uh, global system, global simulations. And for the summary, as I told you already, the uh, uh, relevant uh, for the large scale, uh, for the uh, large rally at the ultimate regime is comparable to uh, melting system. Uh, and the uh, fact that this kind of power law is, uh, uh, is possible to, uh, to be used with uh, parameter alpha to the power of 0 0.25. Uh, why they are comparable? We talked about it because the velocity uh, inside the, the velocity average inside the fluid layer is much higher than the velocity of the interface. We saw this uh, kind of uh, uh, behavior, uh, the polygonal behavior, polygonal shape of uh, the solid uh, liquid interface, the domes, uh, in 3D are much deeper uh, and uh, also it's going smoother uh, to f uh, uh, create a, a single dom dome shape. And there is a weak dependency between new salt and a Stefan uh, parameter, a Stefan number. For the following, uh, for, uh, for uh, the future work, we uh, plan to uh, analyze the system with cavity and see the effect of cavity, any form of cavity. At the moment, we uh, uh, put uh, circular cavity and uh, uh, box in, uh, in the, uh, the, the uh, our simulation. The e effect of bulk heating, uh, which is also important, it is due to radiation and it is, uh, it is what is happening, in fact, in reality. 
Uh, and uh, for the last part, we want to put uh, shear uh, velocity uh, on the uh, interface. It can be realized at having uh, wind or some kind of current uh, in the system and having some kind of forcing convection melting like open channel that is happening in uh, Arctic in melting of ice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Soon to be Dr. Rabatikou. Thanks. <laughs> We already uh, done it. So the solution for analytical part is available. Not from uh, the convective regime. In the conductive case, we can create a, a, a liquid layer at the beginning and a start a simulation from there. Uh, and the main reason we did it, in fact, is that at the uh, beginning of simulation, the velocity of interface is infinite, theoretically. And there's some kind of bursting in this simulation. By putting this kind of uh, initial liquid, uh, we cancel the effect of uh, infinite velocity. Uh, in your introduction, you motivated your uh, approach because it was noticed that the models that are currently used to predict when the icebergs are going to melt don't work. Yes. Now, does it work now? Uh, we have to communicate with them and uh, we put our results in them if they are uh, uh, willing to do that. Uh, no, at the moment I cannot say it is working perfectly or not because nobody has done it yet. Well, what, what do they see in the icebergs? Does it, do they melt too fast or do they melt? It's melting faster than our prediction. So there's a mechanism that you didn't mention in your, uh, your setup at the scale that you went to. Okay. Is there, is, is there any physical evidence that when the iceberg melts from below, that's what you were doing. Uh, it's melting way. from the top because the uh, density profile of water is inverse. We can have the same setup melting from the bottom yeah, so and have the same effect. What, what was in my head when you were show, talking about that is, is there any evidence that small crystals break off from the iceberg, get re-entrained, get entrained in the under, uh, under these cells and so a lot of the uh, heat transfer, I mean, the surface area has increased enormously, which would account for a faster rate. Yes. Is that, is that so if, if you model the water underneath as a multi-phase flow, yes. a particulate with ice and water, then you might capture enough of the uh, heat transfer mechanism uh, to account for the melting. In fact, it is happening. Pardon? It is happening, in fact. So, but so in why would you put that in your model? Uh, First of all, we needed to understand what is happening in convection in the normal way. What, what you are talking about is, is uh, what is happening in I multiple. I think we stop discussion right here. All that you 